And so I'm excited about this talk because I don't know that we've had much on mycotoxins. And I feel like this is a, an issue that's becoming an epidemic. In fact, I bet there's several of you in this room that are probably mold sick and don't even know it. It's, uh, or it's been undiagnosed or worse, misdiagnosed. So it's, uh, it, it's something that's very dear to me now. And Dr. Carnahan is one of the experts in the country. And I'm excited to have her here. So please pay attention to this lecture. It's, I think it's really important. Um, she graduated with honors from the Loyola U University Stritch School of Medicine in Chicago. She got her Bachelor of Science degree in bioengineering at the University of Illinois as well in Champaign. She's board certified in both family and integrative holistic medicine. Uh, she has a great clinic called Flat Iron Functional Medicine in Louisville, Colorado, great town. Uh, and what I like about her is she does some very cutting edge testing, which is what's so important in this because you have to know which tests to do to figure out if you're actually sick with mycotoxins. So I want to bring her up. I'm excited about this. Uh, Dr. Jill Carnahan, you're somewhere here, I know. <laughs> Hello, and good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Griffin. Thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon, class. I hope you're awake and ready to hear about a really, really important topic. People don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care and that they know your why. So I want to start with that. I was born to overcome. And I was born to experience illness in different situations so that I could teach about it. In 2001, when I was a 25-year-old medical student pursuing my dream of becoming a doctor, suddenly I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I remember the day sitting with the radio radiologist looking at my mammograms and ultrasounds. And as a student, you're always learning. So this was a teaching opportunity. And as I looked at the large images of my own breast mammography, and I asked him what they showed, I remember seeing that glint of fear in his eyes and knowing intuitively that something was very wrong. He said, you know, Jill, you're 25, but if you were a 55-year-old woman, this is highly suggestive of malignancy. But you're 25, so get a biopsy and let's see what happens. So I proceeded to have an, uh, a biopsy. And I also remember the call with my gynae oncologist, Dr. Smith, two days after the surgery, when she called me at home. I was sitting in one of those green papasan chairs. You know how you remember those moments in your life, like September 11th, and those types of situations when you will never forget where you were sitting, the color of the walls, and all the details. And this was one of, the, one of those moments because she said, Jill, I don't know how to tell you, but you have invasive ductal carcinoma. You have a very aggressive form of breast cancer. And knowing what I know about 25-year-old women, this was Dr. Smith, the mortality is high, and this is going to be the fight of your life. She went on to talk about the grade of the cells and all kinds of other information, which at that moment I couldn't even process. I remember my entire body went numb, and thank goodness I was sitting down or I probably would have passed out. And the gravity of what I was facing at that moment never really hit me until the next week. And I didn't know if I had six weeks or six months or six years to live. And you see me now, 18 years later, I'm vibrant and healthy and full of life and passion for educating. But at that moment, when your patient faces a diagnosis like I did, you don't know. But like I said, I was born to overcome, and I have this very stubborn Swiss German heritage, uh, which makes me pretty resilient. So I was bound and determined to find a way to overcome that disease. I proceeded to have three drug chemotherapy, cytoxin, 5-FU, and doxyribicin, all of which are very highly toxic in the highest doses possible for my age and weight. And then I had radiation therapy, and I had multiple surgeries during that time to remove the tumors. I took a leave of absence from medical school, and about nine months later, I went back to school, and I was bald, which I learned another term for. It's also called glaborious. Much nicer to say than bald. So I'd say, I'm glaborious, without hair, hairless. And was ready to get back into school. 
and I was weak and I lost weight and my gut was a mess. And so I kind of ignored the next symptoms that I experienced for the six months after my treatment ended. And I started to have more weight loss, malabsorption, bleeding, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. I assumed it was all from the chemotherapy and all the drugs that I had taken, but eventually I had to get that checked out too. And I, after a colonoscopy, I was given the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Just six months after I finished all the treatment and was considered cured from breast cancer. And I remember again sitting with my gastroenterologist in the office and talking to him about options. And he was very clear, Jill, this is an untreatable, it's not untreatable, it's a, a disease that you will have for the rest of your life. It's incurable. And right now what we have is disease modulating drugs like immune therapies. We have steroids, we have surgery. You're probably going to have this for the rest of your life. You're probably going to need to be on immune modulating drugs. And you probably will have surgery over your lifetime considering your age. That wasn't very fun to hear. And I remember asking him, you know, does diet have anything to do with this? And my history was I was always into wellness and nutrition, and I wanted to learn how to reverse disease. So even though I went to allopathic medical school to get a great education, I really valued the holistic perspective. But I didn't know much. I was a third-year medical student. And I remember him shaking his head and literally looking me in the eyes and saying, Jill, diet has nothing to do with this. And this was the look on my face, you're kidding me. But I didn't have enough confidence. I was a third year medical student who was, you know, taught that she didn't know anything. You know how the, the, that hierarchical pattern goes in medical school. And so I didn't have the confidence to say anything to him, but I quietly walked away and I never went back to see him again. And I was again bound and determined to learn and figure out a, a cure for this disease. So shortly after I came across, I was studying and reading and looking at options, and I came across Elaine Gottschall's specific carbohydrate diet. And I thought, well, what do I have to lose? And I didn't tell you, but from the age of 14 till 25, I had become a vegetarian, but it wasn't a very healthy vegetarian. It was more like a carbitarian. And unbeknownst to me, I had silent or latent celiac disease on top of all of this, which probably contributed to the inflammation that led to the autoimmunity and cancer in some part. So I went on the specific carbohydrate diet. And I remember to my shock and awe, within two weeks, my Crohn's symptoms were gone. I had had cyclical fevers. I had pain and bleeding and diarrhea and all kinds of typical Crohn's symptoms. And I remember just thinking, wow, if this is true and, it's, and it continues, diet has everything to do with the gut. And then the journey to look at like what Dr. Singh taught us with the microbiome and SIBO and CIFO, which underline most cases of Crohn's and colitis as part of the factor. The genetics like NOD2 with Crohn's disease, what it is is a person who has an abnormal immune response to a normal microbiome. And to me, it makes perfect sense that I had these chemotherapeutic agents that created massive permeability massive dumping of endotoxins, which I'm going to tell you all about today, into my immune system and triggered this reaction in someone who not only has DQ2, one of the highest risk genes for celiac, and who was on a gluten-full diet, but who also had NOD2, which is a high risk gene for celiac. So I was a genetic setup for this. And then you throw in those chemotherapeutic agents, one of which, cytoxin, has been studied in mice and actually may induce its anti-cancer effect by inducing toxicity into the leaky gut, basically creating a permeable membrane so that that overflow of endotoxins into the system actually creates an anti-cancer immune stimulating effect. So as I learned this later, it made perfect sense to me. And then you throw in that I grew up on a farm in central Illinois that in the 70s and 80s was still using all kinds of toxic chemicals like um, atrazine, which is a known endocrine disruptor, glyphosate in the 80s and 90s, which is, as we've already heard, a known disruptor of microbial um, diversity. So it makes perfect sense to me that it was a setup. So we're going to talk today about the gut and the mold, and that would be interesting if that was the end of my story, but it's not because I went on to be healthy, free of cancer, practicing medicine in Colorado, and in 2014, after the massive flood in Boulder, Colorado, which had been a fairly dry and not moldy city, I found there was mold in my office. 
And I remember starting to have shortness of breath when I'd walk up the flights of stairs to my second floor office. And I remember coming home from work and I'd have red bloodshot eyes and congestion. And I remember trying to think of a word like cat and I would say dog, like I'd mix up words, I'd have trouble with word finding. Or I'd be typing an email to the patient and a word that I wasn't thinking at all would come across the screen as I was typing. I would pick the wrong words. Um, and I would have a lot more trouble if I sat down to write a blog instead of taking 30 minutes or an hour. It took me two hours. It took more concentration and focus than it had previously. And I began to have fatigue, and I began to have skin rashes, and I began to be prone to viruses and other infections. So I had immune suppression, I had massive histamine reactions and skin issues, I had congestion, shortness of breath, cough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And after the flood, it was about nine months when I got so sick that I finally had to figure out what was going on. And you know, in medical school, we're taught that mold is an allergen, and that's true. But what I'm going to teach you today is that mold actually has a bigger effect on the innate immune system in a subset of the population and creates a very diverse set of symptoms that affect almost every system in the body. So eventually, after I came out of my denial, which is very common in our patients, I tested the basement and found bulk stachybotrys which is a very toxic mold that produces trichosethenes, and I tested my own urine and I found T2 high levels of trichosethenes. The day I got those results was the day I never again set foot in my office. That was, it was December 26th, the day after Christmas of 2015. I literally left everything and started over. And I tell you that because as you understand this and you see patients who have this, you may be the one that tells them you need to remediate, you need to leave your home, you need to change your work environment, you need to buy a new car, whichever environment is affected, the most important thing you could take away from this lecture is in order to get well, if you're very sick from toxic mold, you need to avoid the mold. And no amount of supplements or diet or nutrition will overcome massive exposures in most patients that are sick from mold. And that's a hard thing to do as a clinician because, of course, if you are telling them to leave their house or remediate or leave a medical practice, it's costly and it's difficult. And no one really understands. It's not like a tornado or cancer or fire. So that's my story. That's why I'm passionate about this. And today I get to bring in so many pieces of this, of how mold affects the gut, how you can identify patients who have mold toxicity, and how it really probably affects not only everyone in this room, through friends, family, or patients, but probably, like Dr. Griffin said, some of you in this room maybe don't even know it and have had exposure to mold that's creating symptoms. So let's dive in, and before I do, I want to do a disclaimer. I do have fin financial interest. I am a speaker for Microbiome Labs, and I'm collaborating with Quicksilver Scientific to do solutions for mold toxicity. So that's my disclaimer. And I will also disclaim that I never collaborate or speak for or work with any protocols or programs or products that I don't passionately believe in and use myself. OK, so objectives is just to understand this total toxic burden, this concept of what is this problem? How do we identify it? Because once your eyes are opened, you will never again be able to unsee this. And the exciting thing for both dentists and clinicians is it gives you this amazing tool to have an insight into tough cases where the doctors who've seen this patient before you have not been able to help them. And even you, like me, have come to a roadblock of why isn't this patient getting better? And it turns out they're in a massively moldy home. Quick side note, I have a, a dentist patient um, relevant to much of our audience, and he started in his practice having trouble holding his tools. He had a tremor. He would have trouble remembering the names of his tools to his nurse you know, to do the surgeries. Um, he started having fatigue in the afternoons where he'd have to go into his office and take a nap. And all kinds of neurological and, um, syst and systemic symptoms. And he came to see me. And after a significant workup, we found out he has catomium in his home, which is another very toxic mold, and stachybotrys in his office. So he has this double hit. And we're just in the middle, literally this Thursday before I flew out, I sent him the results of his mold testing. So this is brand new, but it makes sense that that's part of his problem in his practice. He's very young. He's in his 30s. So just a little background on environmental toxicity. Um, 
85% of all chronic illnesses are related to lifestyle. Only 15% are primarily genetic. So like I told you, in my case, there's genes that play into this. I was born with like the worst detox genetics in the world, plus a gene for Crohn's, plus a gene for celiac, plus many more, poor glutathione status, etc. So I was kind of set up to be a guinea pig that would have more illness in the same environment that might not make another person ill. So genetics do come into play, and with mold especially, you can have a household or a workplace where some of the people get sick and others barely notice symptoms at all. And this is one of the confusing things for um, the Environmental Protection Agency and for doctors and for uh, patients to understand how in the world could we all be in this home and the dad and the daughter are very, very ill and the mother and the son are pretty much fine. But that's how the story goes. There's usually one person, the canary in the house or the workplace, that gets a lot sicker than the rest of them. And that has to do with, number one, their genetics, and number two, their previous toxic load. And dose is not always the poison. This is just in general for toxicity. Typical toxicology, um, we'll talk about the dose that creates toxic, toxic levels, which Dr. Quigg mentioned that very high amount allowed in the US of glyphosate. Um, but often what happens with some of these chemicals, like the ones I was probably exposed to as a child, atrazine and organophosphates and endocrine disruptors, is they have a, a biphasic curve. They're actually very potent at extremely low levels and then also at higher levels. But these lower levels are not always either well studied or reported in the literature. And then sometimes when you add different chemicals together, there's a massively synergistic effect so that they're way more toxic when you combine them than they are alone. One example of that is Monsanto's Roundup is actually synergistically thousands of times more toxic than plain old glyphosate. Some of the detergents and, and inactive ingredients that they consider inactive in their actual product are very, very toxic in synergy with glyphosate. So it's way worse than it's actually reported by the glyphosate studies. So these low-dose effects are very hallmark, especially of endocrine disrupting effects, which are a massive problem. As you look at the rates of breast and prostate cancer and uh, endocrine disruption in general, this is a big deal. This is just a list of so many of the things that we can get exposed to that fill up our bucket. And on the left is exotoxins. So these are outside of our body, heavy metals, solvents, VOCs, organophosphates, pesticide, BPA, et cetera, et cetera. And these things act synergistically. And you know, it's interesting, I was talking to Dr. Lynn Patrick earlier about the coronavirus and why in certain areas is it more of a big deal than others and why are the people more susceptible in different environments and different age groups. I really believe part of this is toxic load. And if I could summarize what I do functional medicine in, into a sentence or two, what I would tell you is most of my complex patients come down to infectious burden and toxic load. And which one of these things is playing into this? Both of them usually are. And how much of one do we need to treat? So a lot of these chronic complex patients are the toxic load and the infectious burden. And if you have a heavy toxic load, like in China, where the air pollution is astronomically high, their ability to withstand a viral infection is a lot lower. Their immunity is weakened. So these things do play into things like the pandemic that we're seeing right now. And then endotoxins we're going to dive more into because these are things that come from inside out. And literally the gut can poison us if there's permeability and there's a passage of these endotoxins across the membranes into the bloodstream and directly to the liver and create another load. And as um, Dr. Singh mentioned, SIBO and SIFO are big problems here too. Here's the example I mentioned, the toxic load, the bucket. And basically, I think of this when I'm having a patient sit in front of me, is how big is their bucket? How big is their toxic load? And what's great as clinicians or dentists is you don't have to figure out every last thing that's in that bucket. All you have to do is realize when they have multiple chemical sensitivity, or they have neurological disorders, or they have autoimmunity, or they have cancer, you just have to know that their bucket is full and you have to give them back margin, which means you have to start to unload and detox, and I'll give you some tools for that today. But if you just give them back some margin by helping them with their detoxification, yes, it's helpful to identify certain toxins and do a specific protocol for mercury or for lead or for heavy metals of other types like cadmium or for endotoxins. 
But the most important thing is to recognize that most of our patients walking into the office have a toxic load and that we need to actively engage them in detoxification. In fact, I believe, you know, there's these 21-day detox and 30-day detox and all these programs, especially in the new year, they're really popular. That's great. And if you do that once or twice a year, more power to you. But I really believe that we should model as clinicians and we should teach our patients to do daily detox habits. For example, most days I take some charcoal, especially when I travel. Most days I take an Epsom salt bath before I go to bed. And when I travel, I'll, eat, I'll get salt if there's a bathtub, and I'll do that when I travel too. Many, day, many times per week, two or three times a week, I'll use the infrared sauna. And I have just incorporated these as habits because I know with travel and other exposures that my toxic load potential is high, that I need to actively do these things every day or every week to prevent that from being an issue. So you just think about your patient and how full is their bucket as you're seeing them. And then this is just a, a diagram of showing all the exposome combined, stress, radiation, lifestyle, infections, drugs, et cetera. And now we're seeing EMF, electromagnetic frequency, from cell phones, from radiation um, in the house, from uh, dirty electricity. Um, all of these things are also an issue, and especially with mold, and I'll tell you why in just a little bit. So just a reminder, core principles of detox are the total toxic burden. In susceptible individuals, this can be worse in those who have a Poor, more poor to detox. I always think about it as like the size of the bucket, like I was born with a much smaller bucket than average, so the same load on my body would make me ill quicker than someone who was born. We all know those, um, you know, men or women who are 95 and they're smoking cigars and they're drinking shots of whiskey and they are going to live to 105, you know, and we're like, what in the world? How did they get away with that? I would never get away with that, um, but that's all genetics that play into it. So contributors to total toxic burden, again, this is just a background for the mold because the mold comes and sabotages the detox pathways even further. Standard American diet is really quite toxic with all the chemicals and additives, preservatives, um, al uh, alternate trans fats and things, exposure to heavy metals, again, with amalgams and um, with fish, food allergies, environmental allergies, molds we're going to talk about, medications, internal toxins. Um, and even stress, mental, emotional stress, can cause changes in the immune system and in the detoxification process. And then we talk about spectrum of vulnerability, but what's really interesting here is we often this line is used in typical toxicology studies to show where most people will start to get sick from this. These are the people we're seeing in our offices. They're the ones that are extremely sensitive to low levels, and they can get just as sick as those low levels um, as the average, and I think as the environmental toxic load increases, this curve is shifting because the burden is greater. If you think about that bucket concept, the burden is greater coming into it, or like I think in China, the burden of toxicity is greater, so they're more susceptible to infections potentially. Again, that's just my theory, but I think it may, be, may bear out to be valid. Okay, let's turn to mold, the topic you've been waiting for. So. Testing and treatment is in its infancy. And every time I do a presentation, which is a lot, I love talking about this, I'm constantly updating because there's lots of theories, there's lots of experts here that are bringing um, to play the new information. And I just wanted to give credit to a few of the people who have done some of the work. Um, Dr. Richard Horowitz, who has his 16-point MSIDS map, does a great job of bringing in environmental toxicity and chronic um, tick-borne infections and putting together a functional medicine map and a matrix to look at these patients and all the complexities and immune dysfunction. Dr. Richie Shoemaker was the first one to coin the term SIRS, or Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, after he found a bunch of patients that got ill next to a fresh, water, um, fresh body of water that had... Um, some types of toxins that were produced like mold, and he saw this mold-related illness. And then Dr. Navu, if you haven't heard his, him uh, lecture or seen his research, it's on the cell danger response. And very briefly, this to me was the biggest aha of 2019, as I sat in a lecture like you are, all are today. So the cell danger response is this mechanism for our body to repair and recover. It starts with proliferation, and then it starts with regeneration, and then eventually the cell heals. And this can be from an infectious insult or a toxic insult or any of these things. But the cell danger response can get stuck in, in response to PAMPs and DAMPs, whether path pathogen-associated messengers or um, 
damage associated messengers. So for example, if our mitochondria is damaged by a toxin, the contents of the mitochondria spill out and those contents tell the cell, hey, something's not right. Someone just died here. It's almost like there's body parts laying in the street, right? You'd be like, huh, something is not right here. And that's what the mitochondria see. And so then they have, they have this perpetual cell danger response triggered. And when he used a specific drug, which is not yet available in the U.S., to stop the signaling of the extracellular contents to the mitochondria, he has case studies of cures for Lyme and autism and some of the chronic inflammatory, like chronic um, fatigue syndrome that we see every day. So his research is pretty profound on why some of this is happening. And then there's all of these organizations like your own that are taking a new approach to environmental toxicity. Um, Janet Hope, who I know is a member here, um, has written one of the first art original articles that I read on mold toxicity and just talking about mechanisms include inflammation, oxidative stress, toxic infection, allergic, and irritant effects. So it's not just the old school allergens that we thought about before. It actually affects the entire immune system. And then what's the big deal about mycotoxins? So when I'm talking about molds, I always say it's almost like they have personalities. And the reason for that is each mold, say aspergillus or penicillin, they produce a slew of toxins, and the toxins have different effects on different tissues and different people. So when you get a water-damaged building with this toxic soup of um, bacteria and beta-glycans and mycotoxins, you, you can have a varied effect on different people depending on what's growing in that toxic soup. And again, it's confusing because it's never a one-size-fits-all depending on the toxins they produce. They're not easily detectable in the blood. And I'll show you what the testing, the state-of-the-art testing is now. Um, right now, we use urinary mycotoxins and we use antibodies to mycotoxins in the blood. And I'll tell you about both of those. But you can't measure them easily in the blood by themselves. And again, in genetically susceptible individuals, the main um, idea here is there is this vicious cycle of activation of cytokine and of kappa beta and this inflammatory response. And it goes and goes and goes like a merry-go-round. And it tell you stop the initial trigger and get the patient out of the exposure that immune inflammation has trouble calming down. And it'll create a, a lot of collateral damage. So we talked about acquired immunity in medical school, this allergic response. And even now, if we send a patient for like um, lung issues to National Jewish, which is in our backyard in Denver, they're experts in pulmonary function, they'll test for mold allergy, which is perfectly appropriate because if someone has a mold allergy, it can indicate previous exposure. But this innate immune response that we're talking about on the left is a much bigger issue. It's how these biotoxins and mycotoxins actually go directly into alveolar. Um, they basically don't need any transport. So when we breathe mold and mycotoxins in a moldy environment, they go directly into our bloodstream. And a lot of the studies, which I'll show you on children with the gut function, used to be on ingestion. But we're finding just as much of an issue for inhalation exposure because it goes directly diffuses into the bloodstream. And these things are really toxic. The T2 that I was exposed to and that we see in some of our sickest patients, trichosethenes, they're currently being investigated for um, terrorist weapons and things for biological chemical warfare. They're incredibly toxic. They're nephrotoxic. They're immunotoxic. They're toxic to most tissues. And then again, there's a portion of the population who can't easily clear it. And this is that vicious cycle that we see of these antigens, these mycotoxins, stimulating a massive immune. It's like a catastrophic immune response. And then that gets perpetuated because those mycotoxins have trouble being cleared. And it's the genetically susceptible individuals that have more trouble clearing them. So part of our treatment is going to be, how do we help these patients clear the load of mold and mycotoxins from their body and then decrease exposure at the same time? At the core of treatment, it's decreased exposure and it's helping them to clear mycotoxins and molds from their body. And you can be colonized. It can be sinus, respiratory, gut, or other tissues. You can actually have colonization of mold in certain areas. We've, even, we've certainly seen it in the sinuses, and some of the ENTs are starting to write um, the research about fungal, uh, chronic fungal sinusitis being a bigger deal than we ever thought. And I know some of you who are progressive with the dental infections can find all kinds of organisms in the mouth and in the cavitations as well. Just a side note, because I love to tell stories. So I had uh, two root canals, and I should be able to know the numbers because I'm talking to a room of dentists. I think it's number 
2 and 19. Would those be the parallel teeth on either side on the bottom? Thank you. 30 and 19. I'm so embarrassed, but I'm not a dentist. 30 and 19. Thank you. Um, so, and they're the same meridian. So here's my story. I had these two root, uh, teeth that went bad need a root canals, right? This was like seven years ago. Got my root canals, and um, I had psoriasis, and I had had it for quite a while. Never really found a, a permanent cure to the psoriasis, and it was kind of under control, but never gone. And I remember when I was in the Swiss, Switzerland clinic a few years back, um, looking at the German doctor who was very into homeopathy and acupuncture meridians, and on her wall she had a chart of all the teeth with the acupuncture meridians of where they connected to. And this was new to me. It was fascinating. I looked at my teeth. They're both the same ones on both sides, same meridian. And my teeth, those two were connected to the pancreas, the colon, and the breast. That's my medical history, in a nutshell. I had breast cancer, I had Crohn's disease, and I didn't mention, but I have pancreatic insufficiency. When I saw that, it was a big aha for me, and the next day I called my biological dentist, and I said, can we pull these? <laughs> I want to see what happens. Because there was no pain, I didn't think anything, and I mentioned the psoriasis because the truth of the matter is, seven days after I had those two pulled, my psoriasis went away and never came back. And again, you guys in this audience are not surprised at all, but clearly my immune system was in a weakened state and I was having this drip, drip, drip of endotoxins from these root canal teeth with a weakened immune system, my history of cancer, and creating enough of a stimulus to create this kind of autoimmune and, and psoriatic presentation. So to me, that was a big um, aha. I always knew I loved the biological dentist in my town and I feel like they're so critical to my patient's health. But this was one of those end of one studies of me that I realized how important it was to really look at these things. So we talked about biotoxins that causes sears, um, molds and other toxins from water damaged buildings, other toxins from tick-borne infections like Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia can also act as biotoxins on the body. Cyanobacter from freshwater blue-green algae, which is what Dr. Shoemaker originally saw causing illness in his town around that freshwater fresh body of water. And then singulatera toxin from marine dinoflagellates which can be contaminated in grouper and snapper and some of the seafood. And then I mentioned the toxic soup and water damaged buildings because it's not just mold. It's the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds from mold. It's the beta-glycans, the hemolysins, the mannins, all of these different things. So part of the issue is this water damaged building. And back in the 70s, they decided to do something great for the paint, and they put fungicides in it so that we're not going to have any mold growing in buildings anymore. So they put this fungicide in the paints, and then what happens is all the paint that most is commercially used is antifungal, but it acts kind of like the antibiotic resistance uh, and the um, antibiotics do with bacteria. And what it did is, is it killed off the less virulent strains and so now when we have mold growth in houses, it's a lot more virulent because it's resistant to these antifungicides. And that may be why you hear about, oh, your grandmother had you know, mildew in her shower and she never got sick. Um, or 50 years ago, it wasn't as big a deal. Well, there's a couple things playing into this. First of all, our toxic load is greater today than it was in our grandparents' day. Second of all, the fungicides have created, and other things, have created more resistant and toxic molds. So these molds become a lot more toxic in what they actually produce. Um, and these things all collaborate in addition to like these LEED certified buildings and super airtight buildings. Some of the most crazy cases of mold toxicity I've seen in incredibly environmental friendly buildings because they're so efficient. There's no exchange of air and there's condensation and there's problems. There was a New York City very famous um, LEED certified building that had a massive mold issue and made many of the residents sick because it was so airtight, there was condensation, and then there was no exchange. So you could be probably better off in a 100-year-old log cabin that had little holes in the wall than you would be in a 2019 built LEED certified building sometimes. Um, just a little bit about screening. You can actually, you know, hang on to the slide or keep it, but this is a great way to screen your patients because this is a cluster symptom analysis that was um, validated um, with about 650 patients. And what it did is these 13 bullet points are clusters, and each one of these clusters, if, it's a, if there's any one of those symptoms that's listed by a bullet, it's considered a positive cluster. And if you have 8 out of 13 positive, um, go to the, 
8 out of 13 for adults or 6 out of 13 for children, you should probably go on to look for mold as a possibility. So it's just a great screening tool. I'll go back one more time. So these are the symptoms. You want to take a snapshot. And then again, any one of those in each cluster is considered a positive cluster. And if they have eight or more of those bullets, one symptom in the cluster, positive or more, they should be uh, screened for mold. So I use this all the time. The two things I use that are free in my office, because these tests can add up, I use the symptom cluster analysis. And I actually kind of ask them in my history taking these kinds of questions, because I can usually tell if we're headed in that direction. And then the second thing I do is a visual contrast test, which I'll show you next after the environment. So testing the patient's environment. How many of you um, have dealt with anyone who's had mold in your practice, first of all? OK, so about 20%, if I had to guess. And then how many of you know someone in your area who does mold remediation, like a mold inspector? About the same. To me, this is the hardest part of the equation because uh, this is, number one, it's hard to detect sometimes where it is it might be in the walls. Most patients who get really, really ill, there's no obvious black mold growing in the shower. In fact, if you're asking them questions and you say, do you have mold in your house? 99% of them will be like, nope, everything's fine. Or we had an inspection and everything was fine. And I'm looking at the history, looking at the symptoms, all of these things, and I'm thinking, ah, I suspect mold. What happens is you really have to ask the specific questions. You have to say, has there been a dishwasher leak? Was there any um, uh, flooding in your basement? Has there been leaks through the windows? Is there condensation? Has there been roof leaks, et cetera, et cetera? And do you feel worse when you're at home versus on vacation? Do you feel worse in your office at work versus at home? So you ask these kind of questions to get an idea, because they usually won't say that they have mold in their home because they don't know it. Avoidance is key, so this has to be part of your questioning. And I would try to find people in your area. Um, some of the groups I mentioned in that earlier slide have IEPs, indoor air quality specialists, who either do virtual consults in, uh, nationally, or they might know someone in your area who is an expert. Because you really, if you start working with patients with mold, you need to know at least one or two people in your area that can help them test their home. But today, what I'm going to give you is some really practical tools um, that you could actually do with your patients without an inspector. Now, inspection is preferred hands down. And if I had an IEP next to me today, they'd say, Jill, what are you saying? You know, we need to do the inspection to find the mold. And I totally agree. But what you might come across, like I did for a while, was it was hard to find good qualified inspectors. Or you suspected the patients had a problem, and you couldn't find the, the mold. Have you ever had that? Anyone ever have that where they highly suspect an issue and the patient says, inspection's fine, or you couldn't find it? I've had story after story after story where my intuition, my scientific data, and the patient's history pointed to mold as a culprit, and we couldn't find it. I had a couple for two years I was telling them, I think mold is responsible for your symptoms. Do you know what my percentage of accuracy right now for being right on this is? It's 100%. When I suspect mold, there's never, never been a case where later, it might be two years later, that I haven't found out there was an issue. And again, because I've experienced it, I happen to know the pattern really well so I can recognize it. But I remember in the beginning being a little uncertain because I was asking someone to, you know, potentially spend money and move or whatever they need to do to fix the problem. And that's a scary position to take as the clinician because you're not sure. And even now, I, I feel uncertain sometimes. But I've had enough experience now to be much more confident in saying, you have to get this checked out. So the reason all of that to say, there's some tools you can use. These aren't perfect. These are just a tool that you can use and have the patients do. So there's ERMI and Hertz Me testing. These can be done through several labs out there. And the patient will go order a dust cloth or a vacuum canister. I typically prefer the dust cloth. And I have them order an ERMI for the first time. If they have a very large house and, and plenty of money that they don't mind spending, they can do one on each level. That's helpful. But if they can't, they can do one for the whole house. I usually don't have them test the garage in the same sample as a house. I try to make that separate. Or if they know there's a massive water issue in the basement, I say, well, test the basement separately and then test the rest of the house. And when you get these back, you can score a Hertz Me. This was done with a, a fairly large group of patients. And what they did is they took five molds that need a water source and can signify water damage. And those are listed. And I'll show you what the scoring is right here. Um, I want to show you this first, though. Because what they did is they took just five of these molds from the ERMI. 
So the ERMI has like 30 or 40 moles. And you take five of these and you score it. And here's a scorecard, so you have it in your slides. It's 10 points for these numbers and these numbers. And it's Aspergillus penicillin, Aspergillus versicolor, Ketomium, which is a nasty one, Stachybotrys, and Wilaria. And you can score these, and according to the studies, these were patients that were sick from mold-related illness. If the score was less than 11, it was likely safe for them to be there, living. And it was statistically significant. If the score was greater than 15, 99% of them stayed ill. They did not get better in that environment. And these, both those numbers were statistically significant. To me, this is very helpful as a guide that I can do in my office because I can often tell them, gosh, according to this, it's likely if their hurts me score is 24, which is well over 15, it's pretty likely that that environment is, is enough toxic for them not to get well in it. Now, no test is perfect. They still need an inspector. But if you need help in your office to make some decisions, I've found this to be incredibly useful as a tool talked about mycotoxins. The EMMA test is a newer test from real-time labs, and this test tests not for mold, so the ERMI test is a DNA PCR test for mold. It's dust sampling for mold, and it's like a historical snapshot of the home or environment. The EMMA test is newer, and it is a snapshot PCR of the mycotoxins. So mold produces mycotoxins, mycotoxins cause illness. So we're one step closer to the illness-causing um, issue. I've done ERMI for so many years that I still like that, but this is a newer test, and you can do this as well. They're both dust samples. Now, what about your humans? Not your environment, but your patients. Um, urinary mycotoxin testing is very controversial, and I'll show you two of the papers that are opposing views. I still find this to be useful. And the caveats are this. You have to know which company you're using, what kind of technology they're using, how accurate it is. Could there be uh, false positives or false negatives? And I'll tell you just briefly. I'll run through them for you. Um, and then you've got to know the patient, the environment, et cetera. Uh, I find these incredibly useful as well, though, because even if there is some cross-contamination from food, which can happen, um, you still are likely to see mycotoxins in the urine of someone who has more mold issues. And the one paper that is pro-mycotoxin test testing showed that the patients who had mold exposure, known mold exposure, were statistically significant higher on urine mycotoxin levels. So again, as long as you know what you're doing with these tests, um, usually I'll have them do a challenge of glutathione or infrared sauna prior. My first experience with, of this maybe five years ago was two different patients that I thought had mold and they, they were really sick. I did the initial mycotoxin test and it was negative. And it kind of threw me off because I thought, well, maybe they don't have mold. Maybe I'm wrong. Later, I found out they had massive mold. And what I realized is they were so toxic. This is excretion measurement. So if they're super toxic and they're not excreting any mycotoxins, it's going to be negative. So then I started doing this pretest with glutathione and sauna to help them excrete so that you would get a normal positive, a real positive if they've really had exposure. So I do have patients do that pretreatment and it helps to get more accurate test results. And I don't have them do binders prior. This is the two, two different papers. One was by Real Time Labs, who is a testing company, granted, and they talk about their small study that showed um, evidence of higher urinary mycotoxin levels in those patients who had actually been exposed. And the other one is Dr. Shoemaker's paper, who has always been opposed to mycotoxin testing, talking about why it may or may not be valid. Um, and I think the controversy is more that there can be foods that cause mycotoxins in the urine. But even that, in a sensitive patient, I'd want to know about it because then I would have them maybe stop eating so much peanuts or something that has high mold. This particular st study talked about inflammatory role in chronic intestinal inflammatory diseases, which in just a few minutes we'll jump into the gut and how it's connected to mold. Um, but it talked about um, mold being a trigger for Crohn's and colitis. So the test companies right now are real-time labs. That's ELISA testing. So that is less sensitive. However, I find out if I, I find if I get a positive on the real-time labs test, it's it's more likely to be a real positive because it's less sensitive. That was the original test that I used. Great Plains Labs now uses liquid chromatography or mass spectroscopy, which is more sensitive, more specific. Um, it's a great test too, and I love this test. And I'm getting, um, I would say, more positives. And I think they're still quite real, um, but it is more sensitive. So your potential is to get more uh, false positives. 
And then Vibrant Labs now does a uh, direct testing with immunochipped based on competitive ELISA. So that one is even the most sensitive of all. So you have real time, Great Plains, and Vibrant Labs. And everybody says, which one do you use? What do you like? I use them all because for different patients and different people, um, and they're all very good tests. I just wanted to show you what they look like. This is what real-time labs looks like, and they um, put all of their ochratoxin mycotoxins into one, and so these are the four different ones they test, but each one of these has three, four, five um, subsets underneath it that's being tested. This is what the mycotox from Great Plains looks like, and this is all the different pages of it. And for example, there you see verucotoxin. That's one of trichosithines from stachy or um, those nasty black molds. So for example, ochratoxin is very common in the urine for patients. That's the one I see most often, and that's the one that is more commonly from food contamination. So if I saw someone who wasn't very sick and for some reason did urine mycotoxins and had a lot of ochratoxin, I might start to change their diet and then also um, check their environment. But I wouldn't worry as much with the ochratoxin as I would with the verucotoxin or any of the trichosithines, because the trichosithines are the kind that I was exposed to, the black toxic mold, the ones that are being used in chemical warfare types of mold, those to me are a lot more serious. And if they're coming out of the body, um, they're not usually food contaminants either. So it's more likely that if you see those T2s that they're a real issue in the patient's environment. And this is the ones that are tested by Vibrant. So these are just how the panels might look if you tested them. And then there's uh, another test that's out there. I haven't used this a lot yet, but I'm starting to use it to compare because my experience has been with urinary mycotoxins. And this is another big controversy in the industry. And this is antibodies in the blood to mycotoxins. And it was developed by Dr. Vojdani, who many of you know, and Dr. Andrew Campbell, both who I highly respect. So to me, the verdict's out. I can't tell you yet which is better. I'm kind of using both to compare. But this is doing antibodies in the blood. And according to their theory and research, Research, the antibodies are higher if the exposure was more recent. So that's the blood antibody test. And that is, uh, it's mymycolab.com. And this is some of their studies, the IgG antibody levels against all seven of the molds used, um, significantly greater in patients than controls. So implying that overall they're going to be higher if someone was recently exposed. This, another one, exposure to molds increasingly recognizes a major, major reason to test, and this study was specifically from Dr. Ray um, about the blood antibody testing. And I mentioned this, but these can cause cancer. They can be hepatotoxic, immunotoxic. I mean, these are really, really toxic substances. And this is why this lecture is important, because you might see someone come in with MS or with brain fog or with early onset dementia or with Hashimoto's thyroiditis or lupus, some other type of disease, and their real trigger is mold in their environment. So it's very, very important to know, because they won't always get well if they're still living in a moldy environment. Okay, so let's jump into just a little bit of detox on mold, and then I'm going to dive into the gut in the last 20 minutes or so. So basically, we just need to think about, I love talking about basic, simple things that we can all do. One of the things we want to do is clean air, clean water, clean food. You'll hear me say that a lot, but it's simple. We, we get so complicated with, do we do IV you know, therapies, lipoic acid or NAD or some of these things? I always say, go back to the basics and teach your patients clean air, make sure they have air filters in their home. According to the late Walter Crenian, who was one of my heroes, 80% of our environmental toxic exposure is through our air quality. So clean air, clean water, uh, clean system in your home and workplace, and clean food. And just eating organic, trying to clean up your food and your diet is a massive source of exposure. Identify the most common off-gassing sources in your home and take care of that or get air filtration systems. Optimize elimination excretion, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Gut microbiome, we're going to dive into next. Support mitochondria and biotransformation would be a whole liver pathway. So liver phase one, these are key nutrients to support liver phase one. So we have riboflavin, we have milk thistle, we have um, all the B, methyl B vitamins, glutathione, branch chain amino acids, and then minerals like magnesium and zinc, manganese, molybdenum, garlic, onion, all of these things. And you probably know there's a ton of products out in the exhibit hall that combine these into liver and detox support. But I always want to go back to, you can't just buy a bottle of liver support 
and expect that your patients will detox. You really have to think about what environment are they exposed to? Do they have clean air, clean water, clean food? Are they using detox protocols like Epsom salt baths or infrared sauna or those kinds of things? Because those things are really critical. And I will tell you, if I had a choice of giving a liver detox supplement or getting a patient out of the moldy environment, I would always choose the removal from the source first because nothing you do before that will really, really make a change. Phase two is the second phase, and you probably all know this, but just to review, phase one, you have a toxin metabolite, cytochromes converted into an intermediate. That intermediate is actually more toxic and reactive than the first thing. So if you get stuck there and your phase one is going really fast, so that's why coffee in a detox protocol is not great, because coffee pushes phase one. It helps detox. It's a wonderful thing. I love coffee, but if you're doing a detox and you load up the coffee, you're going to push phase one, you're going to get stuck in the middle. Phase two is often more sluggish in our patients, and then they get stuck with that intermediate that's more toxic. So that phase two is really critical, and often, you know, your patients who get sick when you try to detox them, how many have experienced that? Probably all of us, if we do anything with detox. That's because you're pushing phase one quicker than you're supporting phase two. Um, I always say it in this way to patients, and they get it. We're, we're mobilizing toxins, and then we're excreting them. And whatever methods we use, we're mobilizing and excreting. And when you talk about a Herxheimer reaction or a reaction to a certain detox protocol, you're getting stuck, you're mobilizing too quickly, and you're not excreting enough. And so some docs are just like, let's go, let's do this detox, and they're pushing their patients into getting worse, and that's never good. When the patients are getting worse, you actually need to pull back and think about excretion, not mobilization. And excretion is tricky because there's not one pill for it. Usually you have to engage with sauna or Epsom salt baths or IV therapies or just homeopathic drainage remedies or things like that. And it could be as simple as having them drink mineral water, which alkalinizes the system. So I tell people to go out and buy cases of San Pellegrino at Costco and then drink that in the evening. And that, will just, that alone will help people detoxify. So foods that support phase two, brassica vegetables, um, all the organosulfur compounds, so the garlic, onion, thiols are really critical to this process. And then organically grown, ideally, so you don't get more exposure. These are some of the nutrients, um, calcium deglucurate, which we heard about earlier from Dr. Quigg, all kinds of antioxidants, sulfur compounds, turmeric, milk thistle, artichoke, rosemary, broccoli, green tea, etc. And then phase three is all about the gut. So basically, when you have these toxins that are changed from um, intermediate into phase two and excreted into the bile, here's where it comes with mold detox because a lot of these toxins get stuck in the bile. And part of our protocols for detoxification are grabbing them from the bile with bile acid binders. Uh, Dr. Singh gave a great, excellent list of binders earlier, cholestyramine, um, Wellcol and generic, uh, clay, charcoal, zeolite, chlorella, citrus pectin, glycoman, and I could name more. But all of these things are types of binders that will pull the bile acids and help to excrete it through the enterohepatic circulation. Typically, bile is 95% reabsorbed. So again, it's like a merry-go-round that goes around, very efficient. But if you have toxins there merry-go-rounding in your body, you need to do something to help pull them out. And I find combining binders is a great way to do it because each one has slightly different affinities for different types of toxins. So when you combine binders, you get a bigger affinity for more things. And then as we'll talk about in just a moment, the gut microflora has a huge effect on all of this. Cologog herbs, I just want to mention those are bitters. These are incredibly powerful. Another trick I learned in Switzerland was bitters. We had bitters at every meal with our liver detox, and we had the old-fashioned absinthe, which is the bitterest bitter you've ever had. Um, I still have some in my purse for party tricks. Sometimes at dinner, I'll be like, hey, guys, you want some bitters? And if I give it to most people, they make the greatest faces because it's very, very bitter. Um, so you try that. It's uh, called absinthe. It's incredibly bitter, but really powerful for secreting bile acids. Okay, and NADPH, not going to talk a lot about, but NADPH, you've heard all the studies now about NAD, nicotinamide, riboside, and NMM, and all the forms of NAD. Um, very powerful to aid in the detox process. And there's study after study that even mold will actually um, decrease uh, NAD levels. So NAD, I think, is one of the critical pieces that's missing in most mold detox protocols. So it has activity... Um, it, it basically, when you have aspergillus, candida, or any of the fungal species, you'll be depleted of NAD. 
And when patients are depleted, the detox gets stuck, and that whole mobilization, mobilization and excretion is, is locked up, and they can't excrete. So giving NAD as part of your detox protocols can be really important. Um, just a brief mention, because I'm developing a mold detox box with Quicksilver, and this has all the things that I think are going to be really successful for mold detox all in one. We joked about it being the happy meal of mold, which is a really terrible analogy, standard American diet. But what we did is I worked with Quicksilver to really find a protocol that kind of treats the pushing of the detoxification with glutathione, phosphatidylcholine, methylated Bs. It has the NAD in there, which I just told you how critical that is, and most protocols don't include that. And then we have a binder that combines binders and include the electrolytes with the hypertonic solutions. Okay, so back to the gut. Let's go back here and talk about the gut. So there's studies that show that mycotoxins in the gut have a profound effect on the permeability. And that they did, sadly, many of these studies were children in Africa that had mold-contaminated food supplies. So these three tox uh, toxins, aflatoxins, fumicins, and this other one may induce environmental enteropathy, malabsorption syndrome, and it, mal and it manifests with villus atrophy. So it kind of looks on microscopy like celiac disease where they have total villus atrophy. And I'll show you a picture of that. So this is the villi on the right are the normal villi length and size, and the villi on the left are after exposure to mold toxins and mycotoxins, and they had this basically malabsorptive syndrome that was completely related to mold exposure. This is uh, environmental enteropathy. I love that term, environmental enteropathy, basically mold induction of enteropathy, and they saw it in these children. And uh, we're seeing epidemics of things like es eosinophilic esophagitis and these allergic things. And this lecture is not about mast cell disorders. I could talk a whole nother hour on that. But one of the most potent inducers of mast cell activation is mold. So we see that as a comorbidity uh, for a lot of these mold patients. So this was from the study, directly taken from the study on the children with um, environmental enteropathy, and it showed that zinc, vitamin D, vitamin A, probiotics, glutamine, restore, and especially spore probiotics, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, now this is just two studies, one on the fact that this enterohepatic recirculation is dramatically affected by mold, and that because of that affecting cholesterol metabolism, mold could actually be a risk for heart disease and stroke, independent of other factors. And then this one um, is the intro to the last part of my lecture, and it's the connection between LPS endotoxemia and mycotoxins. So mycotoxins are inducing this crossover of LPS-induced endotoxins from a permeable gut, causing massive inflammation and even more overload of the liver. This one um, talked about the modulation of lipopolysaccharide-induced pro-inflammatory cytokines by specific sorotoxins, which are a mycotoxin. So again, when I saw this, this was a big aha, because one of my other favorite things to talk about is the gut. I love talking about the gut. I love talking about how to heal patients from inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, et cetera. And in hindsight, my story, I mean, I certainly had chemicals growing up on the farm, but I also wonder, I grew up in an old farmhouse, I wonder if I had mold exposure as a child as well that also induced some of the inflammatory effects leading to the eventual outcome of cancer and Crohn's disease. And I think the answer is a probable yes there as well. Okay, so lastly, let's talk about how to heal the gut and some really exciting solutions that we have. So on the left, you can see a healthy gut where there's low mucosal inflammation. And Dr. Quigg and Dr. Singh set this up so beautifully because we already talked about a lot of this, so I don't need to spend a lot of time, but I want to remind you, basically, this blue here is the mucosal barrier. That's protective and created by healthy micro microbial contents and also by things like butyric acid. When that mucosal barrier breaks down, as in this case, you get um, increasing translocation of the LPS endotoxins into the bloodstream, creating dendritic activation and massive cytokine inflammation. So the first thing you need is that mucosal barrier. The next thing you need is diversity. You've heard that today, too. Diversity is king when it comes to the microbiome. And there's certain keystone strains. Again, you've heard these, acromancia. Fecal bacterium prusnitsky, bifidobacter, and these guys are keystones because just having them alone will be an indicator of a better diversity. So I always look on my stool test to see, is there acromancia, is there roseburia, those two create a mucosal barrier, is there bifido, and is there uh, fecal bacterium prusnitsky? Because all of those guys are keystones to the diversity argument of whether the patient has it or not. 
And when this mucosal barrier breaks down and you have inflammation and permeability, as we said, the mycotoxins directly cause this process, then the leakage of the bacterial contents, these are lipopolysaccharides, causes a massive inflammatory response. And I'm going to show you a slide of all the different systemic things that can be from lipopolysaccharide-induced endotoxemia. And we can actually measure in the bloodstream elevated levels of IL-6, TNF-alpha, and um, IL-1 beta, which are all part of the inflammatory cascade. So dysbiosis, low keystone strains, these are the ones I mentioned, low diversity, and low butyrate or short-chain fatty acid production. So all of these things contribute, and all of these things are made worse by mold. Now, here's a little pearl for you. You have someone who comes in and says, Doc, you know, I used to not be able to eat gluten and dairy, and all of a sudden I'm really sensitive to so many more foods. Have you heard that story before? My box of foods I'm eating is getting smaller. Mold is one of those things that will cause massive um, increase in sensitivity because of this permeability aspect. So will candida, but those are two things on your list that you would check for if you have someone who has increasing food sensitivity or increasing food intolerance. So metabolic endotoxemia, just to remind you, this is a process that underlies things as diverse as cancer, heart disease, um, metabolic syndrome. In fact, we think it's the primary driver of diabetes and obesity. The studies really show that lipopolysaccharide endotoxemia is a key issue. It also can be a driver for insomnia, bipolar disorder, anxiety, depression, anorexia, low testosterone in men, and autoimmunity. So this is a really diverse thing, and it's very common. If you start looking on PubMed for studies on metabolic endotoxemia, or LPS, you will get thousands and thousands and thousands of studies on this. It is so well researched. So chronic metabolic endotoxemia and the associated inflammation is really driving much of our chronic disease. Endotoxins are just this lipid A um, membrane right here, and it's part of the bacterial coating. So you basically have those li lipid A membranes, and those are the things that create inflammation. Now, interesting, all of you, if you had lunch today, for the four to five hours after lunch, all of us in this room will experience some degree of endotoxemia. And if you get a little more sleepy after you eat, or you get a little more brain fog after lunch in your office, and you have more trouble concentrating, you're experiencing some, de you're experiencing some degree of endotoxemia. Now, the research studies show that about four or five times um, normal, when, you, when the levels of serum endotoxins goes up, that's what's considered endotoxemia. So all of you in this room might experience two or three times. Some of you might have true endotoxemia and experience four or five times, but it's a level of, of rising in the serum after a meal, and that's how it's described. So this is the chemical pathway of it. I won't take a lot of time, but that toll-like receptor 4 is an important signaling molecule, and that circulating LPS is bound to the phospholipid protein, and then they bind to the CD14 toll-like receptor, and they instigate all those inflammatory cytokines that I mentioned, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-1-beta, and others. So clinical manifestations, heart disease, cholesterol problems, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, dementia, cancer, PCOS, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. These are all well-documented um, in the literature of different things that can be an issue. And I've just got a few minutes left, so I want to just show you the study here at the end on where we're going with this. So these studies show all the different data on metabolic endotoxemia, diabetes, et cetera. This is the one, if you just look, leptin resistance, chronic constipation, mood appetite disorders, depression, cognitive decline, loss of memory, depression, anorexia, anxiety, chronic pain, Parkinson's, and low testosterone. And there's more. So this really underlies a lot of symptoms. Okay, so can I have five minutes? Two. Okay, got two, thank you. Okay, yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> I want to honor that. Um, but I want to go through this and, and show you the data because this is really, this is exciting to me. I told you I only talk about things I believe in. Omega Spore has a gut restore program that has the most data that I've seen on restoring lipopolysaccharide-induced endotoxemia. And the program basically has this recondition the gut with a spore probiotic. Little secret, back when I had Crohn's disease 18 years ago, none of the probiotics worked for me. They made me worse. The lactobacillus, the eight strain, et cetera, et cetera. And I found this little probiotic. I had no idea what it was. It was a spore. 
and for 18 years it's been my savior for Crohn's disease. Now I see the data and I understand why the spores helped me so much in my recovery. But back then all I knew was there's this one probiotic, it's different, it's called Bacillus coagulans and it works when the rest of them don't work. Next we have this um, precision prebiotic. And you heard from Dr. Singh how important the prebiotics are. But what you may not know if you're, not, if you're using them, if you have someone with SIBO and SIFO, the bacterial and fungal overgrowth, and you say, take a prebiotic, they will hate you because they'll have massive gas and bloating. And what Megaspores created is a precision prebiotic that's selective so that I still try to treat the dysbiosis first, but they will tolerate this a lot better than the traditional because it's selective for the LPS bacteria. And then finally, the mucosal immune polyphenols. This is rebuilding, and it contains bovine immune globulins, which have been shown to passively bind lipopolysaccharide. It contains amino acids, which help rebuild that mucosal layer, and polyphenols. So you've got this wonderful protocol that I'm finding to be incredibly helpful with my mold patients, with my tough gut patients, and with those patients. And I won't go through the slides, but the last thing I'll leave you with is they did a study in college-age um, students. Now, these college students were on beer and pizza. So they were your typical, you know, not healthy 20-somethings. And what they did is a 30-day study, typical diet. They didn't change their diet at all, and they gave one placebo group nothing. They gave one group of spore probiotic two caps per day. And they had a 45% reduction in LPS endotoxemia. And then all of the inflammatory molecules, ghrelin, IL-6, TNF-alpha, et cetera, et cetera, were all measured. And about 90% of them, I can show you the diagram, were lowered um, in these college students. So this was a pretreatment with a typical American diet with a spore probiotics, and they found it to be incredibly helpful. So I find this to be a really, really good solution um, to that problem. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Carnahan. I hated holding that thing up because I could have just listened to that over and over and over.